Tonight, we assess the achievements of the present administration in a dual state and what lies ahead of who governor of Basaki's successor will be. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyamgu Agaji. For the past 23 years, the political space has largely been dominated by the People's Democratic Party and some of the constituent parties that formed the All Progressive Congress, while others like Labour Party were seen merely as participants. Prior to the 2023 election, the Labour Party's victory in major elections was when Dr. Lucia Gumimiko became the governor of Ondo State. He served two terms and on the party's platform. Tonight, we will be moving our attention to Edo State and joining us to discuss this live is Chief Daniel Egongong Matthew, governorship candidate of the Labour Party, Edo State. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure and honor. By the way, my full name is Daniel Egongong Akwimoka Matthews. Well, that's quite a mouthful. I know. If you would allow me, I'd just call you Daniel. Daniel's perfect with me. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, Edo State is where we are, we are putting our attention. And eventually, even though we've talked about Mimiko being someone who won a Labour uh, governorship election under the Labour Party, we also know that the alliance that Labour had with other parties gave Oshimole his fa first tenure as a governor in Edo State. So, more or less, Labour germinated in Edo State long before other states. But That's what's it. the situation <clears throat> right now? Let's, let's just put one thing to it. Labour Party is an entity of its own. Mm. Oshimole was a Labour leader, not a party leader. Labour is a Labour entity as a Labour force. However, Labour Party has been growing ever since and forming their own identity. And as regards to Edo State, Labour Party is the primary party to be beaten right now in Edo State. And I think um, Edo State Labour Party have established themselves successfully well and uh, although we may have a different uh, party as in terms of uh, the governor at the moment but I can assure you that when it comes to the next election Liberal Party will definitely present a, a stronger candidate and possibility of winning the candidacy or the governorship. But when you talk about uh, Labour Party being the party to beat in the next election that is coming in 2024, right? Uh, yes. What, what happened in the previous elections, the just concluded elections, uh, didn't show that Labour Party was like the number one? It's, it's, it's strange because we have to be very careful and choose our word wisely. We know the political imagination or machination that went across the country, uh, all over everywhere. And... Um, we know the trickery of, uh, of election, electioneering that happened. Having said that, I will be the first to say in the next coming election, with the opportunity of people like me who will declare our candidacy to run, we will do things differently and make sure we win gallantly and fairly. If we conduct a fair election, I'm not saying we haven't, but with all the discrepancies that I've shown, we would definitely have a better result with high doubt. Okay, well, um, we'll come back to labor and labor matters uh, yeah, in the course right. of the program, but let's just look at a do state generally. And uh, for someone like you, for instance, that, who, uh, that intends to run for governor, I'm sure you have been able to identify the problems that a do state has. So speaking generally about a do state, what are these problems that you think need solving in a do state? I think a state problem it could be peculiar, but not very peculiar to just a state. It's a common problem across most of the country. We have a burgeoning population of young people within the eight, 18 to 35, and Edo state have one of the youngest population growth. I see everywhere you go, you see the mass population growth. We also have an education deficiency in terms of in, uh, education deficiency in terms of assimilation in Edo state education system. We do have robust education platform all over across Edo State, but the engagement of the youth with the education system is very limited. There is a table that came out. Edo State is never any on the list of the top 10 uh, active participants of education system. One of the vision we have 
as in Labour Party or myself, is to look at education differently. The tertiary education, most especially, the tertiary education is a primary and secondary school. To look at it differently. Yeah, let's just identify the problems now. And yeah. when we get to the solutions, we'll, we'll find how, out how you intend to do it or any other person should yes. do it. A yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. One is the education system. And look at the way we reorganize the education system. Another one is the small business financing. You see, if you're at the top of the food chain, you have access to loan. You have access to uh, uh, bank support or financial support through family and everything. But majority of the people that keep the commerce going are below that poverty line, but they don't have access to credit. So what we want to do is to create the microfinance. I think no solution like mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. It's access to microfinancing of the low, smaller business people. Another one we should look at is look at entrepreneurship. Rather than building the next generation to job seekers, why not start looking at technical skill with the microfinancing to be self-employed, starting their own business, from an IT to an engineering? One of the key elements I noticed with the burgeoning youth is start looking at social entrepreneurship training skills that allow you to be self-employed, establish your own business, develop your own. Another one is, the another problem is lack of proper functioning of government parastatus. There's no, across the board, many of the government parastatus don't know how to operate on a commercial element. Not, when I say commercial, not necessarily mean profit making. Commercial means the efficiency of government working, whereby the productivity and the outcome of it is commercially run, for instance, if you want to get a Nigerian passport, let me just like the command to bigger scale. They, why do you have to go in to do a registry? They ask you to come back on a different day to do capturing, then a different day before your passport comes. It's a total lack and waste of time. When that could be done systematically in one day. For you to get renew your passport, you not be more than a couple of days or a week. For you to get a fresh passport, maybe doing some check and everything, it should not be more than two weeks. But if we can narrow that gap down, it means the passport office can produce more passport. It means by them producing more passport, they generate more income. It means they generate more income, they have more money to spend on the facility to speed up the, even the process even more. Now, if you take it to a state level, same process works. We just have to look at our government parasites and, and put the social commercial enterprise energy into it, or social commercial enterprise business processing. I remember when I went to Egypt with, uh, with a company called Selika, we looked at the Egyptian government and not just the government, the government parastasis, and we're doing training for government officials on how to operate not as a private sector, but as a commercial driven center. Not necessarily for profit making, but for efficiency and productivity and proper outcome, targeted outcome. You know? It's, that's why we have so many ghost workers in the civil servant, because there's no target, there's no efficiency monitoring, there's no productivity guide. You come to work, you do whatever you want, you go. Where's the outcome? Where's the productivity level? How many people applied for passport this week? How many of those passports have been processed? Who is checking that? Where's the quality control? What's the outcome? Where's the revenue generated? How is the income spent? Is it reinvested to speed up the process? That's commercial thinking. Like a private sector. In the private sector, if you own your own business, you know if you earn 10 naira, you know the whole 10 naira is not yours. Maybe out of that 10 naira, probably about 2 naira is your profit. The rest of 8 naira is consumed by the business. Salary, uh, salary, expenses, and also investment in developing the business. But in government enterprise, they don't see it as a commercial entity that every money they make have to be regenerated to make the service more efficient. Mm. This is the thing. We can also look at community development. There's a major problem with community development. Most of you are in Edo State. You understand? One of the things is mass movement, for instance. Look at community development. If we can connect every local government, we have 18 local government in Edo State. If we can connect those 18 local government with fast speed rail, people co commerce and people will move interlink quickly. The level of people moving to the urban area will dissipate because they can easily travel in between. Goods and service will be able to move freely. I can live comfortably in Urumi, in my village, and still be able to travel to Benin to work, or even 
send my goods to Benin and work. Let's look at commercial way we can move mass movement of people and goods within the state. Railway. We don't even need to look at foreign investment for it. We can do government bonds. Or we can do partnership where they build, they run, they service and maintain, and they give the state percentage without borrowing money from anywhere. I, I guess, I guess um, identifking the problems will have to come with the solutions because exactly. that's what I'm seeing. I, I apologize. Uh, while, I'm while driving into but, because but, the problems are very obvious to we'll, me. We'll, we'll still we'll, we'll continue with that, but yes. I'm, I'm just trying to get a picture of what a do state is. What kind of potential does a do state have as a state? You know, uh, apart from uh, what it gets from the federal government and all, all the things that we have identified before, yeah. what are this potential that we have not seen being tapped, but okay. are available in Edo. Yes, multiple elements to Edo State. We, to, 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 if you look at the youth, the Virgin youth, it's a ripe, 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 ripe uh, um, state for industry to go in. They, we have a very advanced level of youth who are very socially conscious and very, very exposed, whereby they're very trainable and as well very adaptable to any industry that goes in there. The labor force is ready. In industry. If any industry were to go in there, for instance, if I was to happen to be the governor of industry, one of the key things I'm going to do is to make sure all the public service officers, state, local, even the urban, everything will be made used in Nigeria. Say, for instance, like the car. Innocent car, for instance. There's other company, Innocent car, not brand promoting. In order for us to develop the economy faster, and also to generate things. If I approach you and say, come build a factory in Edo State, we have the youth, we have the labor force, we have the opportunity for it to grow. Build a factory in order for us to support your factory from growing. All the government officials, regardless the political party they belong, from, from the local council to the uh, world chairman all the way to the governor, all the orbas, all the, all the officials, we will buy your car and every four years, Mr. Innocence, we will even trade it off. In essence, we exchange the car, we sell it to the market on auction, general public have access to buy. We re rejuvenate that economy. That's one aspect of it. Another thing that we need to also promote, I do see a vast level of cultural display, cultural history, tourism. There's so many fascinating places for tourism. From the Obas Palace, the, histori the historical element of Edo Kingdom itself. Tourism is one thing that's yet to be tapped. Forget any naysayer they say about Edo State. Yes, although it's true, they joke that our own, we have our own 505, we, we don't need the airport, we fly. Yeah, it's good. That's a good fairy tale. But tourism is the biggest catchment area that we need to develop in Edo State. The Gele Gele Seaport is another one. It's ripe. And we are close to other states that big sheep can come in with the well developed. You understand? There's so many opportunities. Even Look at what we, we at one point, the, the palm kernel, we're one of the biggest producers of palm kernel. There's still vast arable land, vast arable land in Edo State that today we can turn into a billion pounds or dollars of production of palm kernel. And there's a multiple essence. If I become the governor of Edo State, I will give grants to those to Farm pan so, canals. Calm down, calm down, <laughs> calm down. We'll, no, get, we'll get there. But 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 what do you think is the reason all this potential have not been tapped? What are those elements, all those things that are standing against these things being achieved in a do state? This is it. It's it's a it's a common problem with Nigeria. We have good leaders. We have good leaders who are very good in managing things. And I want to say this directly to every Nigerian out there. We have good leaders. It's not that we have leaders, uh, we're suffering from leaders. We have good, educated people. But the problem is we lack visionaries. You see, to be a visionary, you don't have to have the, all the education in the world. You just have to be a man of purpose, a man of intention, and a man of goal. And that's what we're lacking. Because... Nigeria is the most educated people in the whole of Africa. And I can assure you there's no part of, Af a part of the world you will go, you will not see a bulging level of educated Nigerians. In fact, in America, one of the top minority vast uh, educated people in America are Nigerians. Same in Europe. So we're not suffering from lack of educated people. 
In Nigeria, we don't suffer from lack of educated people either. So it means we have educated people. We don't suffer from leaders. We have leaders. We have great pastors. We have great imams. We have great kings. It's not we're suffering from leaders. For visionaries. Like Moses said, I've been to the mountaintop and I'm back. I have seen the glory of God. We need visionaries. He said, I'm taking you to a place. There's flowing with milk and honey. We need visionaries. He said, when pe the people who came back, who went to spy uh, um, uh, Israel, when they came back, they said, some naysayers. And the, and the other said, what? It's a place flowing with milk and honey. We need visionaries with sense of purpose, with sense of identity and pride of who they are as a citizen and as a nationality person. First and foremost, I'm an Edo man. I'm an Asa man to be precise, from Urumi. My father is from Amedosha. My mom is from Ukoni. Pure bred Asa man. And I'm damn proud of it. Yeah, and there's still that fight also that uh, the next governor should come from Asa. So I would, that, I would that, concur that, to that, that <laughs> selfishly. However, <laughs> yeah. I, I would say let's, let's agree to that on principle because it's, it's right for that. However, I also want to add a little bit to that. Not just because I'm an Asa man, not just because I'm from Urumi, not just because I fit the profile, but please, if you're going to support me, support me because I have a clear vision and a clear purpose why I'm running and why a do state deserve somebody with a vision for the okay, state. Okay, now, you, you talked about when we were opening, we were opening, you said um, something about um, a do, um, Labour Party being the party to beat in a do state. We have seen, you have an incumbent who is PDP. We have seen a very uh, vibrant opposition in the APC, even though they have some problems right now. Uh, gale of uh, suspensions here and there that is happening in a do state in APC. But we still have two very major parties and there is the Labour Party that you belong to. Um, what are the chances of smaller parties? Because for now, we still call the Labour Party a smaller party compared to the APC and the PDP in a do state. I mean, having won uh, two uh, senatorial seats, that's the APC, and won like five or, so, or more than that, for the House of Reps, and then in the State Assembly and all that. But Labour Party still came like third. Now, what are the chances? There's a great saying that I say, it's not the size of the dog, but rather than the fight in the dog. Right, it's true. We may have not have performed as, as, as expected, but you have to look at the variables why that happened in Edo State. You have to look at the electioneering that happened that led to that. Let's just put that aside. But I want to assure you that as Labour Party in Edo State right now, we're the biggest party in Edo State. Right. Will, they, will the national fight, because that's what we are seeing, will the national fight not affect even Edo State? Because I need to even know what is going on in the, at the national level. Right. I'm going to make this very clear. Abure is the chairman of Labour Party and it will remain so. And we need to be very clear when we say there's a fight at the national, there is no fight at the national, at the national level. We have a group of, these are reputable, respectable men. So as, a, as, as an ASA man, we respect our elders. So I would not like to use colorful words to describe them as a person, but their act is borderline, is borderline anti-democratic and terrorist. You cannot impose yourself on millions of people and declare even the judgment. I mean, we're not in Banana Republic. Labour Party is a social enterprise and independent party. We have a due process. If you think you want to challenge the chairman, go through the due process and challenge the chairman. And the, the, the judge that gave a judgment to vacate a social enterprise independent organization to tell them that their chairman cannot operate, that judge lack legal wisdom. In fact, that judge has acted on a legal imbecile judgment that he has passed because he has made himself the administrator of a social enterprise party and a judge. We have a legal, we have a system. I will address issue. Those who also went to court to present whatever evidence they have, they have no, they have no legal standing to do so. Are they presenting on behalf of the party? 
or are they presenting as the injured party? It's only an injured party could say, oh, this person did this to me, I'm going to court to a redress. No, or are they the legal representative of the party? There's a process. They should report any qualms they have to the party administrative. They look into evidence. If they feel there's a criminal case or there's a civil case or there's any case at all, they will address it with the party committee. The party committee then take action and then address the chairman, either to tell the chairman you step down or this answer this query, not the court, not the right panel. And no one can come and impose them. So it's like saying, for instance, oh, we don't like the current administration. As such, group of us will decide we're going to go to court and impose ourselves all over the country as the head of the president. You can declare today you are the president of Nigeria because you don't like the present administration. We have a way we elect our president. We go through election. We go through the process. If The process may not be perfect, but it's the best democratic system we have. Same in the party. We have a way we choose the chairman. We go through an election process. There's a Congress. If you don't like the chairman, then go through the process. Test your popularity. If you have a grievance with the chairman, put it to the Congress of the party. If you are the injured party and you think the party, and the party have not addressed it, then you can take it to the court. But this group of terrorists have now hijacked the old legal system and they've now gone to an imbecile legal system George, those to are, pass the those judgment. Are, those are really strong words. Because are, it doesn't... It doesn't those are really strong words. We are not in Banana Republic. It's not strong word. We have to apply law and common sense. How can a judge tell a social enterprise chairman that, cannot, that he cannot operate based on a group of people bringing a case that does not directly affect them on behalf of a party where they have no standing? I can now, you and I can decide, oh no, PDP or APC, we think PDP did this as such, we are going to court. There's a legal process. Labor Party have a legal team. If, if the legal team felt that the chairman have committed any offense, it's the legal team on behalf of the party, who is the injured party, we go to court to charge the chairman in, of any offense, not some cowboys, some terrorist self-appointed leaders. I valiantly stand with Aburi. Aburi is the current and will remain the chairman of the Labour Party. And those who are ganging up against Aburi are anti-democratic. And that's not how we should operate in a civilized society or in a civilized party who want to form the government. It's just wrong. These are intelligent people. Please, I beg them, apply intelligence and common sense. And the judge should respect the jurisprudence of the law cannot operate outside the law. You cannot pass judgment outside the law. Aburi have not been charged of anything, accused. I'm not painting Aburi a saint or an angel or making him righteous than he is. But Aburi is a man of integrity and honor. Until proven otherwise, he is the chairman. And that should be respected. There is a process. We have a process. If you cannot say you are a Labour Party person and a true believer of democratic process, and then want to override all that to serve your self-interest. Whose interest is that? Okay, uh, well, it's established. Uh, as far as you are concerned, Abure remains the uh, chairman of Labour, national chairman of Labour Party. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll just take a short break, and when we return, we'll still be talking with uh, a, a governorship, hopeful in a dual state, under the umbrella of Labour Party. Stay with us. Welcome back. In case you're just joining us, the program is Plus Politics on Plus TV Africa, and my name is Nyamgul Agaji. We are here with a, a governorship hopeful of Labour Party in a do state, and he's simply uh, Daniel Matthews. He has a long name within, <laughs> so I begged him to just call him Daniel Matthews, and he accepted graciously. Thank you very much. Okay, now, we've been able to identify the problems of the right. state. Not all of them, because I know that even if we're talking about just the problems that are in a state, not just a do state, it could take a whole day. But some of the things that we have identified, and the wonder I, I had was, what 
is the present administration doing? What have they been doing in the past maybe 24 years even uh, since democracy returned to Nigeria uh, that we still have these problems? You know, what, what, is, what has been the attempt of the previous administrations and the present one at solving these problems that we have identified? It's, it's strange to say that because we can look at it across the country as well. Because, like I said earlier, leadership is the problem we have. And fellow Nigerians, most of well, fellow Edo people, we, we don't lack, uh, uh, I mean, visionaries is a problem with apology. We don't lack leaders. And the problem of that is the reason why I say we lack visionaries is the solutions are already there. The solution to this problem is there. Once you identify a problem, you already are 50 to 80 percent of the solution in the end. Let's pick education, for instance, which I'm very passionate about. My background is in education and public health and, and development and funding and development. If you take education, we can look at education from the tertiary education, the primary schools and secondary school, the, uh, the technical education and the advanced education. I think the solution we need to do is to get the mindset away that the government can run this efficiently, single-handedly, under the administration of, a, of one person in the ministry and the commission of education. It's not working. It's only a fool do the same thing and expect a different result. What I would, uh, uh, would like to see is to have a social enterprise education where the government and private ent uh, entity, uh, private organization work together to now run the schools. Rather than you setting up a private school and charging gazillion unaffordable money for parents, the government knows how much it costs in a public school per student. If they don't know, then they should know. Then why not allow each, say, primary school, the parents' association, give them the right, the power to run the school. Employ the headmasters. All everybody have to, all the teachers and have to be registered with the state to have, have child protection, put in a safeguarding system. Let parents that belong to that school run the school, like a social enterprise. Or let private organizations who are specialized in education work with the government to run the school like a commercial enterprise, not for, not for profit making, like a private school, whereby the funding, rather than you giving the local... Um, chairman who sit on the money to give the local commission who sit on the money, you give it to the school. The school board, they form a board. They know for the whole year, this is the budget. This is the budget for maintenance, this is the budget for, for staff, this is the budget for any uh, other social curriculum activity. Now, they let, manage let, the let budget. Let me get one thing straight so that we, we don't misunderstand. Uh, your funding seems to give some kind of light to the fact that you may not respect the local government authority. Because if you have funding and you're giving straight to the school, bypassing the chairman, it doesn't show respect for the third term. No, no, government. that's not what I meant. So explain. Let me explain that. That's not what I meant. It's not no showing respect to the chairman. If local government chairman are responsible for the education in, this, in, their, in, their, in their local government, yeah. that money is readily available for them. Rather than the local government chairman now paying the salary of each teacher through the local government, he pays to an organization that manages its school. He pays them either quarterly, preferably, or monthly. Quarterly, preferably, and say, this is the budget from the local government, from federal government to state to local government. If local government now look at how to invest and develop their education system, in, do we need to build more schools? Do we, how do we go about improving the schools? Those are the things we look at. Look at education. Another key point in a way to match and bring the young growing population in those state to a parity. Start community college. There's a lot of community college, but the community college I want to focus on is community college that focus on skills. When I say skills, I'm going to leave the social science study out of like business admin, accounting, out of community college. Not because they're not good, they need it. But skill from engineering skill, IT skill. Computer programming, coding, to bricklayer, to air dressing, to, to electrician. Technical skill. But this is the difference of what I would do. That is where I come with the microfinancing. What I would do is to set up a state microfinance bank that anybody who graduates after two years will get a loan with very minimum percentage of less than 5%. You get a loan to go and establish yourself. 
if you are if you are a mechanic bricklayer person or electrician you and two of you can come together and get a loan to set up your own business rather than looking for employment okay, okay. Uh, have you done primaries we yet to do the primaries okay good so now we're talking labor and other parties we're talking labor we're talking apc we're talking pdp and all that now the concern i raised earlier is the chances of Labour Party particularly. Let me not talk about other parties. I know Labour Party because you are here. Um, now, we have contending for this position in a do state under the APC, people like Ezeyamu, Pastor Ezeyamu, who has been there for a very long time, and so many other names that we are seeing uh, that are popping up, people who are interested in this position. Then we have the incumbent who is, the, who is of the PDP, Having the muscles of the government, whether I would like it or not, incumbents, governors use the resources mm -hmm. of the people of the government to run an election. Whether we say it or we don't say it, mm. that is a fact. Mm. Okay, so now labor is coming as an underdog. Mm -hmm. And then you said that the system was rigged, more or less, in the last two elections. I would say it was really, I think it was questionable. Uh, well, I believe in the democratic system. In semantics is a matter of semantics. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it was questionable. Yes, now, at best. That system is not going away soon. What do you intend to do as a party to make sure mm -hmm. that you excel more than you did in the last two elections? Very good question. You see, changes in the way from the deepest valley in Edo State to the highest mountain to the widest street to the lowest village. Every aspect of Edo State is ripe for change, and change is coming like an unstoppable, unstoppable train. But they were ripe before the presidential and governorship election. And it's still growing. And I'm going to tell you something that might blow your mind. You see, Eze Yamu and all those people, they can run by the grace of Almighty God and by the grace of my ancestors. I know I'm going to win the primary, and if I was to run against them, we would win in the last slide. What if you don't win the primaries? I will win the primaries. No, but what if now. you don't win the primaries? I'm talking Labour now. No, no Labour Party. But I Labour Party will still be in the fray, but I, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> let, me, let me blow your mind. This is my shock you, but not shock me. Everything I lay my hands upon, God has given me the grace to prosper in it. For because I do not desire for my self-interest, but I desire for the greater good and the greater purpose for a greater calling. For I have not called myself to victory, but God has called me to victory. As such, I have no doubt, no doubt, no iota of doubt in me by the, by the mighty grace of God and by the, God, by the grace of my ancestor. Victory is not only defined by you we, we taking the first place. Victory is defined by the purpose that you stand for. And that's why I would win without a doubt. So your purpose is the Labour Party's purpose, or Labour Party's purpose is your purpose? What, what is it? My purpose is Edo people's purpose. Edo people's purpose is my purpose. For a change, for a better government, for a functional society, for the value and rule of law, for integrity and an open government, where somebody cannot die from just having a malaria, uh, malaria that is curable by one or two tablets cannot afford to send their child to school because they have no means to sustain their school. Or cannot even have three square meals when we have the arable land that we can invest or give loan or give sustenance to grow. That is my vision. Where security is not to, for the privilege, but for everybody. Where you can freely be who you are. Where a son or a child of nobody can dream and become, to, and dream to say, one day I can be a governor. Where you can believe in your ability, not in Godfatherism or not in opportunity of, of entitlement, but in your ability and God-given right to stand as a man or a woman, to say, I, Chief Daniel Egongo Akwemoka Matthews, will run and successfully win the nomination and become the governor of Edo State. Not because of anything else, because I'm proud as a man, regardless. Okay, uh, well... Uh, this is only the fifth month, are we? No, no, this is just the fourth month. Yes. And the election is coming in 2024. That's right. Um, well, Edo is your passion. It's, it's not a passion. personal passion. Edo is your passion. And whether or not this government is doing well is 
is, is subject to where you stand, Absolutely. whether it is your party or not your party and all that. But before the 2024, which, uh, as you pray, you might uh, take the reins or someone else might take the reins, what would you advise the present administration to do to finish strong and good? I have no better advice for the present governor or any other governor that I've come before. One of the things is we in Edo people we respect our elders. I respect Obasaki. It's not for my party. I, I, I personally don't know him. I know he's doing his best. Rather than us criticizing what he, he, he hasn't done right or passing this past No, judgment. what can he, at least from now, what, what else can he do? What, what, one thing I would like him to do is to make sure the next election is done successfully and respecting the rule of law, the rule of INEC, and the rule, rule governing election. Let us have fair, and fair election, at least, the basic. Another thing he can do is to also help Edo people in regards to general welfare. At least, before he goes, Create a welfare state that support the widows, the widows that support children, public health care that support widows and children. He can do that now. He can start that while people like me can come in and build on it. We, we know we need more roads. We know we need the road fix. We know we need a lot more things, but something he can readily do now, create a welfare state for widows and children, most especially in the public sector. In most especially in the public sector. Just, why, why is that? There's so much need for that. There's so much need for the welfare state in terms of the public health in a dual state. One of the dangerous things is people self-medicate. Not only self-medicate, people go through the traditional, which is good. I believe in that as well. The self-medication is causing a lot of death. And people, childbearing, for instance, is, is astronomo astronomical in a dual state. Even though we have a burgeoning youth level. Provide a social care for age appropriate, anybody in their 18 to have a public health care. People who are widow, people who are old, to have a public health care. They have access to public health care. He can do that. He has the power, the means, the resources to do that right now. If that's only the thing left for him to do, just create that social wealth, public social welfare. Where people, back in the days where children used to have free immunization. When I was growing up, I had free immunization. All my immunization was free. Now it's no longer in existence. Immunization from polio to fever to everything. People die needlessly of fever, malaria fever that has been eradicated because those free immunization we used to have growing up as a kid don't exist anymore. He can start that now. Now and say free immunization from malaria, from polio, from every other those. Uh, transmittable disease. He can do that. He can look at widows. He can look at older people who are dying endlessly for no reason because they don't have the proper care. Or their kids have grown, they move far away from home and they don't have the necessary care to sustain them. Support charitable organization that is doing widow's might. That's giving this, what I call the soup kitchen, where we give old people free food, homeless people free food. He can do that. The governor can do that right now. He doesn't need massive legislation. He doesn't need massive money to do that. He can do that. He can lay that foundation for people like me to come in and build on. Okay, uh, well, <laughs> when we're talking about uh, governance in Nigeria, one of the things that really is worrisome to a lot of us is uh, a lot of people, Nigerians, including me, is the issue of continuity. A lot of times people come into office and the first thing is to rubbish every blessed thing that the previous administration has done. And I mean, an administration cannot be 100% bad, Absolutely. no matter what. That's right. So if you were, by God's grace, to take the reins of leadership in a dual state, what are some of the things you think this administration has done that you can build on? You see, everything they've done, like I said earlier, I said, I'm a, a do man, we don't insult our elders. So, and as so as Just center, choose the ones that you think. Yeah, I, I would, everything the present administration have done, I would build on. I would try to advance it. One of the things I know they've done very well is, as bad as the road system are right now, they're working immensely to improve it. And one of the things they're also working on is trying to capitalize the economy. 
And I don't think they actually have a clear pathway or clear understanding on how to go about that. One of the other things they do in, in Edo State is the drainage system. They're actually building some drainage system because we have a flooding problem in Edo State. And they're building a drainage system in Edo State. They're also building a water gathering place. Mm. You understand? That is something I can build on. You understand? I would not rubbish any past administration because their challenges differ from the administration to administration. But what I know for a fact is build on what they've, built, what they've had and work on those areas they struggled. I won't say failed, but struggled. Improve on the area they struggled with and also bring in a community sense of responsibility. Put everything you do in the hands of the community. Let it be community-owned driven. That way, the rapid level of growth, advancement, development will be faster because it's not driven from the top, but it's driven from the bottom up, not from the top down. Okay. So, well, at this point, we'll just wish you a very, um, wish you luck <laughs> in your Best endeavors. Luck. And uh, we've been talking with Daniel Egongo Matthew, uh, the Labour Party uh, governorship hopeful in a Edo State. It's been enlightening, telling us the problems of a Edo State and how to solve them, at least some of the problems that are in public glare. And we're, we're hoping that one day we can, we can ask the one who, uh, eventually takes the reign of leadership in a do state, the relevant questions that uh, need to be answered. That is what is lacking in our political space. You don't get to ask the questions because there's no opportunity. But we hope that with the political climate nowadays, we can always do that. We'd like to say thank you to uh, Daniel Matthews for coming on the show. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much for having me. It's a Thank great you. privilege and honor. All right. Until we do it again, it's at same time, same time tomorrow. My name is Nyamgul Agaji on behalf of the entire team saying thanks for being there. Bye for now.